Welcome you all here, and of course, especially uh, Professor Polinka and Mrs. Polinka. Uh, we have another uh, distinguished guest from abroad, Professor Alvin Rosenfeld, who heads up probably the largest Jewish studies department in the United States at the University of Indiana at Wayne. Alvin, welcome. Uh, this is, as you all know, a superfluous lecture. Kreisky in 1973 already said there is no more anti-Semitism in Austria. Uh, and uh, we are 33 years later, so this will be essentially a historic lecture, <laughs> <laughs> as I understand. Uh, and really, certain people, uh, I'm exceptionally glad that finally, after a number of years, that you're targeting to bring them here, that finally works out. In fact, it's not only this time, it's also next time we will have Professor David Cook from Rice University in Houston on the 4th of July. Professor David Cook is the expert in the world on apocalypse and jihad uh, in Islam uh, since its beginning until uh, today. And we, uh, with that, we will close the Berman series this year. Uh, Professor Anton Pelika is not only a leading internationally known political scientist, he's also a very, very courageous person. Uh, he called Haider what he was, and he was taken to court by Haider a number of times. One time, initially, he was condemned, as far as I recall. Ultimately, the higher courts squashed that uh, condemnation and uh, also. Uh, additional, uh, uh, there was an additional uh, complaint by, by Haider. And since then, uh, it's uh, permitted to say that uh, Haider is a defendant of national socialists, I understand it also. Yeah. Uh, Professor Polinka, as you have uh, seen, uh, he is present the director of conflict research at Vienna University. He also is professor of uh, political sciences at the University of Innsbruck. Uh, he has written very widely about Austrian politics and European politics, and he has held many distinguished fellowships, visiting professorships, academic positions in Europe and the United States. I'll only mention a few, uh, which are good enough, Harvard, Stanford, and the University of Chicago. So we were very glad to hear your reflections on uh, Austrian anti-Semitism. Thank you, Dr. Gerstenfeld, for introducing me in such a friendly way. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and uh, to talk to you about the subject, and as Dr. Gerstenfeld has mentioned, talking as a political scientist about anti-Semitism in Austria. This means to underline, despite Kreisky's saying, 20, no, 33 years ago there still is anti-Semitism in Austria and for everybody who is dealing with that subject, not surprisingly, uh, there is anti-Semitism all over Europe and now even almost, you can say, all over the world and Austria is not an exception. I have uh, said, Dr. Gerstenfeld, uh, I am not prepared to give a 60 minute speech. Uh, I just uh, see my role here to give you some ideas, uh, some sketches about the specifics of Austrian anti Semitism, and I would be extremely glad if this would be an input you can use to raise questions, to make remarks and to show your own opinion on that particular topic. Uh, my approach is that Austria, in some respects, is a special case, and in other respects, is just an average European case. Austrian anti-Semitism has its unique aspects, its unique character, but in other respects, it's just the mainstream case of European anti-Semitism. Now let me start with Austria 
as a special case. Of course, this has a lot to do with history. Now, Peter Pulzer's classical analysis of the rise of political anti-Semitism in Germany and Austria underlined the Austrian specificities. Uh, they have to do, of course, a lot with the specific political situation in Austria, a multinational empire. You can call it uh, a United States of Europe in the making, the United States of Europe which failed, but nevertheless this is multi-ethnic, multinational character that was a rather unique framework for the establishment of nationalisms of any kind, including Zionism. Now, Peter Pulzer and other authors have stressed especially the impact of two persons, two Austrian politicians, Georg Schönerer and Karl Neuger. Both had a strong impact on the young Adolf Hitler, at least this is what Hitler claimed in his book Mein Kampf. Schönerer, the leader of the pan-German movement in Austria, was a kind of ideological racist anti-Semite uh, who claimed that the Jews were not a religious identity but an ethnic or racist identity. The Jews as a race. The topic is not anymore the religious beliefs, the topic is the so-called quote unquote blood. Loeger on the other side was a, a, a religious pragmatic anti-Semite. He was the leader of the social Catholic movement in Austria and especially in Vienna at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. And he picked out Jews as scapegoats. Uh, he did not have a coherent theory, if you can call Schönerer's so-called theory coherent, but in a certain way Schönerer was consistent. Uh, uh, not in an academic or scientific way, but in a political way, Luega was completely inconsistent. Uh, when Jews uh, seemed to be helpful, he forgot that they were Jews, and if Jews were useful as scapegoats, he was violently anti-Semitic. Uh, Hitler uh, wrote in his book that he learned from Schönerer, the consistency of the ideology, and from Loega he learned the ability to use anti-Semitism for appealing to the masses. So the political tools Hitler claimed he was able to use are from Loega, but the ideological or so-called theoretical viewpoint was Schönerer's racist attitude. Now, uh, this particular role Austria played in the making of the politician Adolf Hitler and the prominent role Austrians played in the Nazi regime uh, give Austria a specific role, of course. Uh, a second aspect for this specific role is the difference between Germany and Austria. Austria was treated differently from Germany by the Allies and, you can say, by the international community. Austria was seen as a unique and a specific case. Starting with the Moscow Declaration of November 1st, 1943, when the Soviet Union, the United States and the United Kingdom declared Austria to be the first right. victim of the Nazis' expansionist policy. In the second paragraph, they also declared that Austria has a kind of responsibility for the war crimes of the Nazi regime. The second paragraph was conveniently forgotten in Austria after 1945. But nevertheless, this victim theory started with the Allies. As it was the main reason the Allies uh, formulated this victim theory was a very pragmatic one. The foreign ministers of the three allies uh, conferred in Moscow preparing the Tehran conference of November 1943 
and they could not find an agreement about the primary goal, Poland, they found an agreement on a secondary goal, Austria, and of course uh, following the logic of an alliance, they pushed forward where they could agree to make forget where they could not agree. In 1945, this Moscow Declaration became the cornerstone of Austria's self-understanding in the world after the defeat of the Nazi regime. When Austria was a victim, how could it be that Austria should feel responsible for World War II and especially for the Holocaust? And the very convenient Austrian attitude was, if there were crimes, they were German crimes. And if there were uh, crimes within the Holocaust, the Germans are responsible, not the Austrians, because all Austrians were by definition, by the declaration of the Allies, victims. This was uh, the rhetoric of the Declaration of Independence of April 27, 1945, as well as of the State Treaty of May 15, 1955, when it's a preamble, Austria. By the signature of the now four allies, plus the Austrian government was defined as a victim of the Nazi regime. Now, this victims theory was on the short time very convenient, on the long time it was very counterproductive for Austria. On the short time it made Austria able to distinguish itself from Germany and from the Nazi crimes. This has a lot to do also with the question of restitution of Jewish property and of the property of other real Nazi victims like, for instance, uh, homosexuals, like gypsies, like political opponents of the regime. Uh, on the short time, this victim's theory paid off. On the long time, it was counterproductive because Austria had not to go through this period of soul-searching like Germany had to go through. Um, now, the victim's theory uh, is, in that respect, a huge and crude simplification because it does not distinguish between Austria as a state and Austria as a society. Austria as a state, you can say, has been a victim because undoubtedly Austria as a sovereign state lost its independence in March 1938 due to a military blackmailing <coughs> by the German government, but Austria as a society was not more a victim than the German society was. Uh, there were Austrian victims, first and foremost uh, the Jewish population of Austria, most of them Austrian citizens, others like political opponents of the regime, but the majority of the Austrians was not a victim, at least not in March 1938, and there is a broad discussion in Austria, I don't think there is a serious answer possible. Did most of the Austrians back the Nazi regime or not? You can say a huge part of the Austrian society back the Nazi regime. If it was the majority or not, depends very much. Was it March 13, 1938 or was it maybe April 1st, 1945, I would say in April 1st, 1945, a much smaller number of Austrians backed the Nazi regime as it was the case in March 1938. Um, the term, the ordinary German, Daniel Goldhagen has used to explain what has happened in the Holocaust, can also be seen as the ordinary Austrian. Austrians participated in all the crimes of the Nazi regime, especially in the Holocaust, as Germans did. And there's a debate going on, started by Simon Wiesenthal in 1966, that the percentage of Austrians participating actively in the Holocaust was above the average, above the percentage of Austrians within the German Reich in the period. This can be debated, but nevertheless, it's quite clear that the Austrian population participated 
to the same extent as the German population did. Now, I said that victims theory was counterproductive on the long run, and this was seen especially when the Waldheim crisis started in 1986. There were other events before that, for instance, the Kreisky, Wiesenthal, Peter conflict in 1975, but in 1986, the international community forced Austria to face this dilemma of being a victim but having the same percentage of perpetrators as Germany had. The Waldheim crisis led to an official redefinition of Austria's position, and it was especially Chancellor Franitsky, but also President Klestil, who declared the new formula, despite being a victim as a state, Austria as a society has co-responsibility for the Nazi crimes, including the Holocaust. And now, the last point to underline my first hypothesis, Austria is a specific case. Now, in the 1990s, interestingly enough, when the Austrian government redefined Austria's position vis-a-vis -vis the Nazi regime, Austria became also the country with the most successful party rooted in the Nazi past, the Austrian Freedom Party, which was not a new party. Uh, its roots were going back to Schönerer, to the pan-German movement, to the Altdeutsche Partei of the beginning of the 20th century. And in 1949, uh, a new party, but rooted in this background was established the League of Independence, Verband der Unabhängigen. You can say it was a party founded by smaller Nazis for smaller Nazis. And when the real big Nazis became all the political rights back in 1955, the League of Independence was transformed into the Freedom Party of Austria, Freiheitliche Partei Österreichs, you can say this was a party founded by big Nazis for big Nazis. The first chairman of this party was Anton Rentaler, who was Secretary of State in Hitler's cabinet and also a general of the SS. I don't think you have a case in Germany that the party was successfully established by a former SS general. This is rather unique all over Europe. Now this party, the Freedom Party, was a small to medium-sized party until the 1980s. Five to seven percent of the electorate and the policies, the orientation of this party was oriented towards becoming mainstreamed, becoming established in the Austrian party system, still dominated by social democrats and <coughs> conservatives. Um, now, in 1986, when it was obvious that this mainstreaming of the party was not really successful because the party did not go over significantly the 5% uh, uh, electorate, um, the party changed its strategy with a new chairman, Jörg Haider, and became not only radically xenophobic, radically anti European, but also outspoken defending the Nazi past. Just two famous or infamous quotations by Haider. In 1991, it, he declared in the Corinthian Diet that Hitler's employment policies were proper, ordentliche Beschäftigungspolitik. And in 1995, at the meeting of the veterans of the SS, he declared this SS members honorable people, ehrenwerte Menschen. Uh, now, in 1999, after huge successes within the electorate, the party was able to rise from 5% to 27%. The party <coughs> joined the cabinet in an alliance with the Conservative People's Party, but what is interesting, especially for our topic anti-Semitism, after joining the cabinet, the party started to decline. At the moment, 
the party is split between two groups, one so-called dissidents still at least indirectly led by Jörg Haider called Alliance for Austria's Future, BZÖ, Bündnis Zukunft Österreich, trying to stay within the cabinet, within the coalition with the conservatives. The other one, the true freedom party, tries to follow the past success story playing not only to the xenophobic electorate of what we call modernization losers, but also to those who have nostalgic feelings about the Nazi party. Now, three arguments for my first thesis, Austria is a specific case. Now, some arguments for my anti-thesis, Austria is not specific at all, Austria is within the European mainstream, and this is much more directed towards anti-Semitism today. Now, if we uh, try to analyze all the public opinion data and all the other empirical data we have about Austrian anti-Semitic attitudes, we can say some determining factors which define anti-Semitism in Austria today. The first one is education, and this is maybe the only real point of hope we have. The better educated Austrians are, the less they are inclined to have anti-Semitic attitudes. Uh, this is a huge reversal from the time before World War II, when Austrian universities were hotbeds of anti-Semitism. Now, Haider almost does not dare to give a public speech at an Austrian university, because the mainstream of university students is maybe conservative, maybe social democratic, maybe green. Green is a very important party for university students, but almost nobody is backing Haider. And the main reason is uh, education has worked after 1945 against anti-Semitism. The less educated Austrians, the other side of course, the less educated Austrians are, the more they are inclined to have anti-Semitic feelings, to reflect the traditional anti-Semitic stereotypes of the Jews as the capitalists, of the Jews as communists, and so on. The second factor which uh, explains anti-Semitism and Later on I will try to make it a little bit more soft, but at first we have the hard data. The more left-leaning in political terms Austrians are, the less they are inclined to have anti-Semitic stereotypes. At least the traditional stereotypes. We can also say the left is more sensitive towards the traditional aspects asking about anti-Semitism. I come to the phenomenon of a new left anti-Semitism in Austria a little bit later. Um, so you can say the typical Austrian anti-Semite is a lesser educated, with a certain probability, male Austrian, which has not an education beyond uh, eight years at school, who is afraid of foreigners, foreigners taking away his job, and he still thinks, according to tradition, he has assimilated with his traditional upbringing, not in the school, but in his family, that the Jews have a negative influence on Austria, on Europe, and on his life perspectives. Now, one, I think, uh, significant factor we have to take into account is the Catholic Church. As you know, Austria is traditionally a Catholic country. The number of Catholics is declining in Austria, but still about 75% of the Austrians are Catholics. Footnote, only a minority of this 75% of the Austrians are active Catholics, meaning attending church services regularly. But nevertheless, the dominant Austrian culture is strongly influenced Catholicism. Now this Catholicism in the past, I had the example of Luiger, 
the Austrian Catholicism before 1938 had a strong, was a strong factor in shaping the anti-Semitic environment, the anti-Semitic atmosphere in Austria. Uh, this has changed after 1945. The official Catholic Church, meaning the bishops, have become more or less outspoken critics of anti-Semitism. Maybe they're not so much inclined to discuss, to discuss the Catholic past in Austria itself, but for the contemporary situation, uh, the official Catholic Church is more or less